Hey, welcome back everybody. It's still Gettysburg 159. I'm still Gary Edelman and you're still with the American Battlefield Trust. As we go around the battlefield and drill down to sort of regiments and batteries and some of the soldiers within. I'm really excited about this one. A lot of y'all like to stop here and I think we're gonna get some new information. But before we do, let me string you along a little bit because we're still talking here about July 2nd, 1863. And on July 2nd, you're aware that there's, right in the traffic pass, a massive attack of Hood's Confederate Division of McLaws Confederate Division and of Anderson's Confederate Division or part thereof. So you've got more than 15,000 Confederate soldiers attacking at famous places, Devil's Den, Little Round Top, Cemetery Ridge, the Peach Orchard and elsewhere. And this one stands square on the way. We're standing at the Trosa Farm, but we're looking up toward the Peach Orchard Ridge sort of, and you can't see much from here and neither could the gunners who are gonna be here. Specifically, when the Confederates attack the Peach Orchard after sort of Joseph Kershaw, South Carolinians go toward it, then Barksdale's Mississippians come over in this direction, roll over the Peach Orchard, and they're really starting to threaten the Union batteries. And there are several along the Wheatfield Road. Think of it as we're standing along uh, the Trossel Lane here. The Wheatfield Road is over that hill over there, and there are a bunch of batteries on it. And to talk about those batteries and what happens afterwards, let's bring on our good friend, Doug Dowd's U.S. Army War College Licensed Battlefield Guide and 70 other things. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. All right, gang, so if we think about the battery that's out there, one of those is the 9th Massachusetts. Now, this battery, this was their baptism of fire. In fact, when John Bigelow takes over them, he recognizes that they're ill-disciplined, they're ill-mannered, and they've only been in the defenses of Washington. So when he takes over, uh, he has them take eight roll calls a day. He has them drill, drill, drill. He has them wear their full uniform. In fact, his bugler, John, or Charles Wellington Reed, says he's an, a true tyrant. Worse than a regular, he is... He treats us as if a slave treats slaves. Now, what's going to happen is he's going to get them to a fever pitch. He's going to work on their proficiency, discipline improves, and then even Reed has to recognize that Bigelow understands his business. Now, when their battery gets out there, they're going to start firing, as Gary talked about, first at the long-distance batteries at Hood's uh, divisional attacks, then at Robertson's, Texans, and Arkansans going into the Devil's Den, and finally at Joseph Kershaw's South Carolinians. When the peach orchard explodes at about 6 o'clock in the evening, he would now be facing Mississippians that are coming in from his right and South Carolinians that would be coming directly at him. Batteries would peel from west to east off the Wheatfield Road, all headed back going through this gate to try and get back towards Seminary Ridge. One of the last batteries to go is Bigelow. In fact, Freeman McGilvery will ride up and say, you need to get your battery out of there. And that's when he recognizes that his battery should retire by prologue firing. Now, what this means is effectively you're gonna take the rope that's around the trail of the cannon. They're gonna hook it up to the limber of the caissons. And what it does is the horses will pull the cannon back and as the men continue to load the piece. And then when it fires, it would recoil. The horses would take out that slack and continue to drag it back. Look at where we are. We are 429 yards away from where they're gonna to start to retire by recoil. And it is on this day that all of his men start to realize this is what Bigelow had prepared them for. Because retiring by prologue firing is the equivalent of break glass in case of emergency for an artillery battery. And effectively what they're gonna do is mark their path going across this field with each yard that they advance to get back here. And when they get here, they're getting ready to limber up and head back when Freeman McGilvery will ride out and tell them to hold at all hazards. Well, this is an order now to stay in this position and if you look it's not all that great you can see there's only a rise of about 50 yards in front of it that's all they can see and if we look off to the west where those mississippians are coming there's a rise not more than about 100 yards in front of them so they're trapped in this corner what he does is he sets up his battery in a half moon shape in fact he's going to violate protocols he's going to stack artillery rounds right next to his pieces and what they're going to do is they're going to fire canister off to the south carolinians that are threatening their left and to the to the west of them, almost four of his pieces are just going to bound solid shots over this ridge line at those Mississippians, who will now be working their way around his left. In fact, things are getting tight, and each time the cannons fire, the recoil mechanism is going to send them closer and closer in together with less and less space. In fact, Bigelow says his men and horses are falling like hail. And finally, what he's going to do is try and get one of his sections out of here because they're running out of space. And of course, the first cannon to try and go through this gate is going to clip that fence. It's going to topple over, and of course, friction on a battlefield, and they've just closed the one way that they have to get out of here. The second piece will now go directly over the wall. So now he only has four pieces left. In fact, maybe his best officer, uh, Christopher Erickson, a 28-year-old Norwegian cabinet maker, was wounded earlier in the day. In fact, a piece of case shot had gone through both of his lungs, and every time he spoke, he could only speak in a whisper. But the frothy blood would come out of his mouth, but he refused to leave his position. In fact, as they're sitting here, you now have Confederates moving in from the south, and we'd also have those Mississippians moving in from the west, 
And now Bigelow would recognize that they're getting closer and closer and they were yelling like demons. In fact, as his men fell, finally he's going to try and give the order. Wellington Reed will ride over to Bigelow and say, watch out, as six Confederates fire. Two bullets would go wide, two would hit Charles Wellington Reed's horse, and two would hit Bigelow and knock him down. As Bigelow was on the ground, he'd now see Confederates with club muskets and bayonets fighting his artillerists with rammer staffs and hand spikes. It will be then that he gives the order to get out of here. What Reed will do is come over and get Bigelow back up on his horse, and what he's going to try and do is ride him back up to the ridge line. Bigelow says, if you ride like this, you will kill me. And so finally what Rellington Reed has to do is stop and he will start to walk his horse all the way back up to the ridge line towards Cemetery Ridge. In fact, there'll be artillerists up there now having used that time that this battery had bought them saying, get down, get out of the way. And Reed will calmly walk him all the way back up to the ridge line. And for those actions in 1895, he would be awarded the Medal of Honor. The, the butcher's bill for this operations that we just talked about buys 20 minutes at the cost of 28 casualties, three of four officers, six of eight sergeants, and 19 of his enlisted men. Of course, uh, Bigelow would survive because of the works of Charlie Wellington Reed, would rejoin the battery by the fall. He would be part of the battery that would be part of the Overland Campaign in 1864. He would fight all the way into the fall of 1864 when he gets ill and he retires out of the army. He would later go on to serve in the Massachusetts State Legislature. Charles Wellington Reed would also survive. He would become, uh, he was already a wonderful artist and I'm sure you've seen his work because his work is the pictures like this of the battery going into action on July 2nd when they first go out to take up their position out on the Wheatfield Road. He would later become a, uh, an artist for the Boston Globe, for battles and leaders, for hardtack and coffee. But by 1864, he joins the topographical engineers and puts that artistry to work. And of course, uh, later on in life, the one thing he would do was constantly stay in touch with his one-time tyrant and now friend, John Bigelow. Gary? Thanks so much, Doug. You know, we're, the rain was supposed to start about 10 minutes ago, and I said, man, we better get this thing done. We have the umbrella ready, but I think we just got a one-hour tour in about seven minutes. Well done, <laughs> Doug. Doug, do we want to show anybody the cannon since we're over here? Yeah, we sure do. So, interestingly enough, uh, one of the things a battery never wants to have happen while you're in combat is to lose any of your guns. And yet here on July 2nd uh, in the afternoon, Bigelow's going to lose four of his guns. These 12 pound Napoleons, normally a battery would be composed of 150 men and 110 horses. On July 2nd, Bigelow would start with 104 men and 110 horses. Of course, 88 of those horses would be shot down in this position. And most know of that relatively famous uh, photograph taken here right after the battle, showing all of those horses that get downed in this position. We're almost standing in the exact spot as we look back up to Trossel Barn behind us. Of course, also with these uh, these 12 pound Napoleons, they were made for this kind of work. Yes, we have rifled cannon at this point, but these smoothbore capable of firing canister so effectively were made for close in anti-personnel work. And of course, this is exactly what they were used for. Gary? Excellent, thanks so much. Now, can I borrow that picture yeah, again? Because check this out just real quick. And you know, this is weird lamination. I've never heard such a thing. <laughs> when you come out with me, my stuff is crinkly. It's hard to see and it's just awesome. Let's walk behind the cam camera. This is Evan Portman behind the camera there. And let me just show you if I can get you, Evan, to come in on this and make sure there's no glare here. Of course, now that I took that, you see this rock here? It looks like a little V. There it is. Okay, so you can take this photo and line up this little V with the corner of the barn over there and you can line it up and know exactly where you're standing and therefore exactly where these horses are as well. Now, let me ask Doug one last question because battlefield guides and others love to speculate on this. Oh man, it's on the back of this cannon here and it says C-O-R-A. So let's see which camp Doug falls into. Do we not know? Is this the cannoneer's girlfriend? Is this the name of the piece? Or is it a government uh, sort of uh, acronym to say that it has been retired, Doug? I go with, if it's an artillerist or soldier from any other time, it's definitely someone's girlfriend or the name of this piece that they are responsible for taking care, for literally pampering to make sure that it saves their lives on a day like July 2nd. Thanks so much, Doug. Thanks to Evan behind the camera. Thanks to Ancestry.com and Fold3 for giving us a lot of the information we're using on these videos. Thanks to the Gettysburg National Military Park, the Gettysburg Foundation, and not the least of all, Doug Dowds, our good friend um, and licensed battlefield guide here. Thanks for joining us, and thank you for supporting battlefield preservation and education.